the sermon text this morning taken from today's gospel reading. Then Jesus said to his disciples, if someone wants to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and continue to follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. Thus far the words of our text. Grace, mercy, and peace be unto you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ of God. Amen. Today before us, four young men will take their confirmation vows. And on such a day, such a day as today, all of us who have taken our confirmation vows should once again reconsider them should once again think about them. Think about what we have promised to do, what we have taken an oath on our honor to do, and the confession of faith that we have made a promise to adhere to. Of course, we know that we have fallen in some ways, that we have not kept those vows, but we have also repented of our sins, and we have been forgiven our sins. And such is the Christian life. Such will be your lives, gentlemen, your lives. One time, I guess, or once upon a time, or at one time, confirmation vows, maybe they sounded like Uh, a mere formality, something that we went through and it was nice and our family gathered together and uh, we said them and, and then we moved on. Maybe they weren't taken all that seriously. The church held a place of prominence in society. Wednesday was set aside for the church There were no club sports on Sundays to compete with your loyalty and your allegiance. Now those days are gone and past. And even we who deplore those things can't wait to get to Cracker Barrel after church. So somebody has to work. Western culture that once flourished in medicine and science and civil rights under Christianity, now has become antagonistic to Christianity. And the world no longer wants tolerance, but it wants approval. Approval in many areas that the church just cannot give. We cannot and we will not sanction the killing of babies in the womb. We will stand and always stand for the sanctity of marriage between one man and one woman. These are our stands, and for those stands and other stands, the Orthodox Church is approaching a point where it will not be tolerated. Like the world of the ancients, when no one bothered to think about it if anybody held many gods, and worshiped many gods. But it was the Christian insistence on an exclusive allegiance to Jesus that gave rise to persecution. So does it appear that such days will return. If you can hold many truths at once, you're fine. But if you stand on the exclusive truth of Jesus Christ, you're not fine. You are guilty of hating and being wicked. Today, even our own children, the children of the church, are turning their backs on their Savior. They're rejecting a belief in a creator and following the ways of the worldlings. Some have left their confirmation vows to follow the false teachings of other church bodies. Some have fallen for the religion of science. They have opted for choosing God's gift of reason over God's gift of revelation. 
And if the baptized are doing such things, then what of those who have no allegiance to Christ? How will they treat us? And you, young men, how will they treat you who today publicly pledge your allegiance and your lives to the God who created you and to the Christ who died and rose again for you and to the Holy Spirit who enlightens you with his gifts and to the church which proclaims these things. You see, today, you young men are taking a vow to follow in the way of the cross. And by extension, each of us have taken that vow or are on our path to taking that vow. But what is the way of the cross? The way of the cross is the way of seeming defeat. Didn't it appear that way to Peter? Pulling Jesus off to the side and telling his his master, no, no, it won't be that way for you. Heaven forbid that you go to Jerusalem and die. Peter and the other disciples right now couldn't get past the dying part, and apparently they couldn't hear the rising from the dead part. And Peter was trying to dictate to Jesus how Jesus would save the world. And Jesus turned to him and said, away from me, Satan, you are a hindrance to me. Because the way of the cross is a way of seeming defeat. It appeared that Jesus would not succeed in his mission. He would not succeed because the people were thinking of worldly success. But that wasn't success as far as God is concerned. Jesus would go to Jerusalem. Jesus would suffer there in Jerusalem. Jesus would die on a cross on a hill called Golgotha. Jesus would be laid in a tomb, dead. Jesus would rise again on the third day. That's God's plan. A human plan? A human plan would be to raise an army. A human plan would be to conquer the world. That's not God's plan. Jesus must yield to those who oppose him. He must suffer the fate of unjust suffering on our part, and only by Jesus suffering and dying will people be saved from sin and death. After his death, he will rise victorious. That's how it's going to go down for Jesus, and it can't be changed. Those who follow Jesus are taking a vow to follow Jesus on this exact same path, the one he walked. We will bear our crosses. And the first cross that you and I are going to bear is ourselves. The first enemy that we will face is ourselves. Because we're all infected with original sin. And because of that, we must deny ourselves. We must quit thinking and desiring that God's way of dealing with the world conform to the way that we would do it. Why doesn't God show up and fix evil? Why doesn't he do that? Why doesn't God stop children from dying? Why does God not abolish suffering? To deny ourselves means that we will not assume or expect that God's way of doing things is going to line up with our way of doing things. That God's way of working in the world will not conform to our version of success and glory and victory. We must also crucify the flesh What does that mean? It means we often want to be in charge, especially in the church and over our brothers and sisters in Christ. Because living in each and every disciple of Christ is a dark conviction that can destroy unity and do untold damage to the name and the proclamation of Jesus Christ. 
Put me in charge and I will set things right. Ambition in the church, comparison, and criticism are all the ways of exalting oneself rather than denying oneself. But the way of Jesus is the way of humble obedience. It is the way of submission to the will of another. Every Christian must confront the darkness within, and every Christian must deny that darkness within themselves. For if anyone wants to follow Jesus, let him deny himself. And then in general, the daily struggle with sin and the self-denial is a form of taking up the cross, but more specifically, a believer will come up against the evil of the world, and sometimes the outright malice of the world. Gentlemen, you need to be prepared for that. It will come in ways that you don't expect, or it will come in ways that you see coming 100 miles away, but it's gonna come and it's gonna come for you and at you. The malice of the world. But by putting aside the desire for power, a Christian will open themselves up to attacks. They'll open themselves up to shame. A Christian will open themselves up to harm. It just depends on the circumstances, on how things are gonna go down for you. Being a Christian is not easy, and it's not necessarily popular either. But this is your vow, your vow today to bear your cross and to follow Jesus. And as these young men take their confirmation vows today, I ask that not just they, but each and every one of us consider well the vow that we have taken or will take, depending on your age. For a promise is something very solemn. A little book written in 1939, confirmation book called Remember, puts it this way. Even among men who have no faith in God, a promise is a solemn thing. Men and women who break their promises are universally distrusted and despised, and they have no place in the company of honorable men. Your confirmation vows are the highest and the holiest promise you have ever made or will make. When your pastor spoke to you, he was standing in the place of God. You were making a promise to the Most High. You are entering into a covenant with God himself. Never again, not so long as you live, will you make a promise that is more solemn than your confirmation vows. It was an either or promise. Either you keep it and you are blessed in this world and the world to come, or you break it and you are lost for time and eternity. It will make or break your life from now on. Remember, too, that it was not a promise made in private or before a single person. Think of all those who were listening as you took your confirmation vows. Your pastor was listening, and the pastor must give a report to God on the day of judgment that you kept your vows or you broke your vows. Your parents and your friends are listening, hoping and praying that you would never forget. And above them all, invisible but surely present, was your Savior himself who died on the cross in order that you might be able to make your confirmation vow. Only because he has forgiven you all your sins and will continue to forgive them until you die, could you have the tremendous strength to stand up before all of the world and all of the hosts of heaven on the day of your confirmation and cast your lot in with Jesus forever? 
may you forget everything else before you forget your confirmation vows. Perhaps there will be men and women in your life who will forget a promise you made to them. God never forgets. Even on the last day, when heaven and earth shall pass away, he will ask you before his throne on high concerning the vow you made before his altar on earth. And therefore, gentlemen, all of us, Remember, remember well. Amen. And now may that peace which passes all understanding be in your hearts and your minds through the one true faith in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. You have been sharing in the morning worship at Zion Lutheran Church, 205 Pulaski Street in Lincoln, Illinois, where you have just heard Reverend Mark Thompson deliver the message for this morning. If you cannot be physically present, join us every Sunday morning on the radio at 8 o'clock over WLLM 1370 AM or WLLM 105.3 FM or on Facebook Live or on the internet at www.zlclinc.org. Zion services are also available on Cable Channel 5 and on the LCTV app on your smartphone on weekends at 10 and 5 and on weekdays at 8 a.m. and 5 p.m. Zion is a member congregation of the Worldwide Fellowship of the Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod. If you are without a church home, we invite you to become a part of the Zion family. If we may assist you in any way, please call us at 732 732- 3946 or write to us at Zion Lutheran Church, 205 Pulaski Street, Lincoln, Illinois, 62656. Zion also offers a premier education with a Christian worldview for children from age 3 through the 8th grade at Zion Lutheran School. For more information concerning our school, please contact the school office at 732-3977. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be and abide with you all. Amen. Thank you.